Good afternoon. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, if you haven't noticed on the calendar, there are two different lectures for this week. There are two different videos I'm making. Uh, there are two different units we're having to cover, and I apologize for that. It's just the way that the schedule fell this week. And I want to make sure that for spring break, I truly give you some time during spring break where you don't have to really you know, worry about work as much. So have to double up one week, and this is the week that we do that. So the first thing we're going to talk about this week is 19th century China and Japan. This is going to be what happens to those two countries during the 1800s. And the first of the two places I want to talk about is going to be China. Now, when we get to China in 1800, the Chinese government and the Chinese civilization, it gave every appearance of being a superior civilization. But in reality, China was starting to crack. Like, for example, between 1750 and 1850, uh, China's population increased from 180 million to somewhere around 450 million. This meant that the demand for food vastly outweighed the supply of food. Uh, China ended up with famines and in cities the food prices were soaring and people couldn't afford to eat. Starving peasants are going to flee to various parts of the country in the hope of finding food. And this meant that those peasants were forced to sell their land to speculators at prices that were you know, dirt cheap. So that meant that the Chinese peasants, who were truly the backbone of the economy, are going to be driven deeper and deeper and deeper into poverty. Now, who was not being driven in pover into poverty were the public officials, who were also the landlords, rice merchants, and the wealthy became very wealthy, but they also became corrupt and inefficient. Now, it's in all of this that's going on and a couple of natural disasters that the British are going to start building an empire that's going to go around the globe. The British are going to be searching for raw materials for its industry. It's going to be searching for new markets to sell its manufactured goods. And one of the places that Britain is going to settle on is China. Now, British merchants are going to import large amounts of tea, porcelain, and silk from the city of Canton in China. And they expected that the Chinese would buy British goods in exchange. Uh, but in reality, there were few British manufactured goods that the Chinese wanted. So the British were forced to pay for Chinese goods with silver. And to balance the cost of imports with China, the British are going to turn to opium, which was produced in surplus next door in the, in the uh, colony of India. And it's the sale and use of opium that's driven by the British that is going to really get the British into the country. The British merchants are going to smuggle in large quantities of opium into Canton. And by 1830, eight out of every 10 people living there are addicted to opium. Many traders in the city of Canton are going to make huge profits from the sale of opium. And the Chinese government is absolutely horrified by what they see. The only way that the Chinese government sees that they can combat the sale of opium is to make it illegal. Now to carry out the task of making it illegal, a highly respected Chinese administrator whose name was Lin Zhe Zhu was sent to the city of Canton and Lin is ordered or Lin orders, I should say, Chinese merchants and foreign merchants to surrender all the opium cargo to Chinese government officials. Now, the British merchants are going to agree to Lin's order, but instead of handing over the opium directly to the Chinese government officials, 
the merchants instead send it to British naval officers in the harbor. Normally that wouldn't be a big deal, except by doing this, that made the opium the property of the British government. So when the Chinese officials board the British ships and seize the opium, the British claim that it is an act of war. Now this war between Britain and China is going to become known as the First Opium War. It does not go very well for the Chinese. And the Chinese are clearly no match for the British Navy. By August 9th of 1842, the war ends. The Chinese are forced to accept British demands and they sign a treaty where they're treated as unequals. Now, China was forced to give certain privileges to the British, but they really got nothing in return. And the Treaty of Nanking, which is the result, gives Great Britain the ability to do business in five additional cities outside of Canton. So instead of just doing business in Canton, the British can now do business in Canton, Amoy, Fuchao, Ningpo and Shanghai and those five port cities are now going to be open to British merchants, British government officials, British families, British citizens, you name it. Oh and also the Chinese are forced to pay the British something like 21 million dollars for the destroyed opium that was deemed illegal. Great Britain is given Hong Kong, and Great Britain, by the way, keeps Hong Kong all the way up until I think it's 1999. And Great Britain is to be given anything that China gives to other countries. So if Japan gets a puppy, Great Britain gets a puppy too. That's how petty the British were. And then last but not least, the Treaty of Nanking let British subjects be tried under British courts, regardless of whether the crime happened in China or not. Now, the Opium War and the Treaty of Nanking, they're just the beginning of China's problems with the West. Uh, the British are eager to sell more stuff, particularly in the North, and the British and the French together are going to join up in what becomes known as the Second Opium War. Now the French claimed that one of their missionaries had been tortured and executed in the countryside and in 1856 as a result Britain and France declare war against China even though there was no proof that this French missionary had been tortured, captured, executed. None of that was proven. But didn't matter. So the governments of France and Britain are going to invade the city of Beijing. They drive the emperor out of his summer palace and China again had to pay for losing another war. The Second Opium War resulted in British missionaries being allowed to convert the Chinese to Christianity, and it gave the French control of the southern part of China. And before you know it, uh, several different European countries are going to come in and start to carve China up for their own uses. And if you look here at the map, you'll see it's kind of color-coded. Russia gets the northeastern part, which is known as Manchuria. The Japanese get a part that becomes known as Mankuko, which is really southern Manchuria, right next to where Korea is. The French get um, the southern part near where Vietnam is, French Indochina. Germany, they get the, uh, oh, what is it called? The Lao Tung, no, the Shangtung Peninsula right near the city of Beijing. And then the British get basically the entire Yellow River Basin. 
China is still going to be ruled by a Chinese government, but the Chinese government is very, very weak. Eventually, though, in 1850, this secret society known as the Taiping Tianquo, or the Kingdom of Heavenly Peace, begins to use Western ideas and Western thoughts to kind of try and overthrow the Chinese government. Now, the founder of the Taipings was Hung Su Xuan, who was the son of a peasant, and Hung studied Chinese classics to prepare for the civil service exam. He also read Christian writings. Now he failed to pass the examination. Uh, he became ill. He supposedly saw visions and he declared himself to be the heavenly younger brother of Jesus. And as the heavenly younger brother of Jesus, he thought it was his mission to destroy the Chinese Manchu dynasty. Those that follow him become rebels. To show that you are a follower of Taiping Tianquo, you cut off your pigtail braids and these rebels start to demand certain things, such as equal rights for women, the ability for women to take the state examinations, the ability for women to become government officials. Uh, they wanted an end to private property ownership, and they wanted foot binding to be made illegal. And if you don't remember what foot binding is, take a minute to look it up. Not only that, though, but the use of liquor, opium, and tobacco became violations that were punishable by death. Now, the Taiping Rebellion, uh, it meets a lot of wide opposition. Uh, merchants feared losing the special privileges that they had gained from the Opium War Treaties. The wealthy thought that they would lose their land. And ironically, the Taipings even lose their peasant support because the Taiping basically violate the vows that kept the peasants and the landlords in check. Now, ultimately, the Taiping Rebellion is going to fail because Western powers refuse to acknowledge it or support it. By the time it's all done and over, the over 20,000 Chinese people are, I'm sorry, not 20,000, but 20 million Chinese people are going to die. Now, even though the rebellion fails, there is a legacy here. This is a turning point in Chinese history. Uh, the rebellion it drained all the energy that was left out of the Manchu dynasty. The government never regains its pre-rebellion strength, and the ideas that were behind the Taiping Rebellion are going to continue. Now, the Opium Wars, they made it clear that China could not compete militarily with Western weapons and Western technology. And then you have the Taiping Rebellion that shows that there's a need for internal change. And the government of China was forced to modernize whether it wanted to or not. And ironically, it was thought that this modernization would be able to save save how do I want to put it? Save Chinese culture, if you will. I mean, I mean, that might sound a little bit excessive, but that's the best way I can put it. So what was going to happen here? Um, the attempted reforms, China's going to adopt as much Western-style government as it can. It's going to create a Western-style parliament it's going to adopt a constitution complete with separation of powers. 
It's going to modernize its civil service and modernize the law code. Um, they're going to publish the annual budget. They're going to create public schools. I mean, they're going to try and do their best to become a Western-style country. Now, the emperor at the time, Huang Su, approves all the suggestions. He dismisses his most conservative officials, and he puts these changes into effect. But they only last from June 11th to September 21st, 1898. It's about 100 days. And eventually, Emperor Wang Su will be overthrown by his aunt, whose name was Su Si. And that's a picture of Su Zi up there at the top. So any attempts to change are pushed back, and that upsets another group of Chinese. And this new secret society that was going to lead the next rebellion is known as the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. Now, in short, the Righteous and Har Harmonious Fists are known as the Boxers. And that's because they practice this ritualistic form of Chinese boxing. Uh, they were dedicated to driving foreigners out of China, just like the Taipangs were. But the boxers, unlike the Taipangs, are violently anti-Christian. By 1900, many foreign diplomats and their families were living in, in the city of Beijing. And the Empress, Aunt Su Zi is going to let the boxers into the capital city and say, have fun. And before the boxers are stopped, they kill 242 foreign dignitaries, thousands of Chinese converts to Christianity, and the rebellion will eventually be put down, but it takes a multinational army of over 20,000 troops to invade the country. And when I say a multinational army, I'm talking Germany, the United States, Japan, Russia, and Britain all had troops in China in the year 1900. A lot of people don't know that. Now, following the failure of the Boxer Rebellion, a new revolutionary is going to come to power, and this is like a modern revolutionary. He's Western educated, he's Christian, he's a doctor, and it's this guy named Sun Yat-sen. Now Sun needed support if he and his followers were to drive all the Western powers out of China, and if Sun Yat-sen is going to return China to the Chinese people, uh, he had to get support. Now where does he get support? The some of the people he gets the most support from were the Japanese government. The Japanese government provided financial support and opened Japan schools to young Chinese. Uh, Sun also received support from Hawaii, the United States, and Southeast Asia. Now, a lot of these Chinese supporters living outside of China hoped that the overthrow, overthrow of the Manchus would end the unequal tariffs that were imposed by the West. And Sun Yat-sen really had three principles. Uh, he called for this movement of nationalism. Uh, Sun demanded the overthrow not only of the Manchus, but of all dynasties. He wanted all foreign people removed from Chinese soil, and he wanted China to return back to true Chinese control. Now, Sun's second principle was democracy, but it's not democracy in the way we think about it. It meant democracy as individual freedom. The Chinese people had little understanding of the democratic process. Uh, Sun Yat-sen thought they could be trained in it, but his form of democracy immediately called for individual freedom. And the last thing we have is agrarianism, sometimes known as statism. Uh, it called for fair distribution of land, 
and Sun Yat-sen hoped to buy land from landlords and then give it to the peasants. This movement that's led by Sun Yat-sen is going to culminate in the Nationalist Revolution of October 10th, 1911. Um, when the revolution breaks out, there's little resistance from the Manchu government and 4,000 years of unbroken dynastic rule end. And China, at least for a little while, is going to have a democratic style government. Now, the other country to look at is going to be Japan. And when we last spoke of Japan, we had just closed the borders. The Portuguese and Europeans are excluded from the country. And in reality, from 1635 until 1853, Japan doesn't really change. It develops its own unique culture, its own unique style of living. And the Japanese avoid all foreigners except the Dutch, and the Dutch were allowed to maintain a small port at Nagasaki. Now, it's through these Dutch contacts that the Japanese are able to keep up with world affairs. So the Japanese, they're not truly cut off. They know what's happening. They know what's going on with China. They know that the European powers are coming in and trying to take control of things. But they do their best to remain separate. Now, here in the United States, as part of the idea of Manifest Destiny, uh, President Millard Fillmore is going to dispatch a naval squadron to Japan in 1851. And this naval squadron is going to be commanded by a gentleman named Commodore Matthew Perry. On July 8, 1853, Commodore Perry sails into Tokyo Bay. And meets with representatives of the Shogun and asks for fair treatment for shipwrecked sailors, the establishment of a refueling station, basically a gas station, and a statement of goodwill from the government of Japan. Perry then left the harbor in Tokyo Bay, said he'd come back in one year, and let the Japanese people deliberate. Now, when Perry does return in 1852, the Treaty of Kanagawa is signed. And the Treaty of Kanagawa was kind of like the Chinese Treaty of... Um, the Chinese Treaty from the end of the uh, um, First Opium War. Uh, for example, American traders living in Japanese ports would be protected by the American army and American laws. Tariffs were worked out so that the United States could sell stuff to Japan at low cost, but uh, Japan could not do the same. And it really, really starts this discussion in Japan on whether they should westernize or try and keep out the western invaders. So it did not take long for the Japanese to recognize the strength of the West. It didn't take the Japanese long to realize that the West was technologically and militarily further advanced than what Japan was. And one daimyo clan, remember one, one clan led by a daimyo, a lord, the Chozu, uh, reacted to the coming and going of Western powers by trying to attack their ships. Other Japanese argued that it would be a wiser idea to develop a blend of Western technology along with traditional Japanese culture. And it's that group, led by the Satsuma clan, that are going to lead to the opening of Japan and the restoration of the monarchy. Now, opposition to the Tokugawa shogun had Shogunate had grown throughout the 1800s, and in 1866, the Chozu and the Satsuma uh, were two of Japanese most powerful families, agreed to a pact of friendship. And they are going to join together to overthrow the 
government of the Shogun and bring a Japanese emperor truly to power. Now this Japanese emperor was originally named Mutohito, but when he becomes the emperor, he's going to change his name to Meiji. And it's the reign of Mutsuhito that becomes known as the Meiji Rebellion. And roughly speaking, 1870 to 1950, 15, I'm sorry. So 1870 to 1915, that is going to be the Meiji Restoration. Now the Meiji Emperor did not actually rule by hand. He let an elite group of people make most of the decisions and most of the elite are made up of Chozu or Satsuma Samurai. And they realized because they were military men that they had little chance of defeating the Western Empire. So they decide that they need to industrialize and modernize to be able to, to compete with the West. In April of 1868, the Meiji government passed what's known as a Charter Oath. And this Charter Oath gave the Japanese people a legislative assembly that would decide public matters. Uh, they had, the oath also abolished class lines. It gave equality in theory to everybody in Japan. There were also some land reforms and some military reforms that were done. And this is going to be like a wholesale change in the way the Japanese do business. It turns out that the Chinese, or not Chinese, but the Japanese were extremely willing to learn from Western societies. Um, Japan imported Western advisors to help them write new laws and update the economy and industries. Uh, the Meiji government sent Japan's best and bright students to universities all over Europe. And when those students came back to Japan, they brought with them the ideas of modern banking, modern methods of communication, even how to conduct uh, modern armed forces. And the government is going to even modernize the economy. A modern banking system is put in place. The Japanese yen is set to be about half the value of the U.S. dollar. The government changes the way taxes will be collected. Instead of paying taxes on the crops you produce like was done originally, that goes away and the peasants will be forced to pay an annual tax based on what their property is worth. Students are sent to Europe to learn what to do. Western advisors are brought into Japan to help the government learn what to do. And the end result with all of this is the quickest and most thorough period of industrialization that the world had ever seen up to this point. It took basically a decade to completely change the way Japan was run. One of the representatives was sent to Europe in 1882 to study the various forms of government there and it was recommended that the government of Japan follow the German Empire model. So in 1889, the Japanese constitutional government was completed. A constitution was handed down to the people, almost like a gift from the emperor, and the constitution was just a mess. It retained the emperor as the hereditary head of state. It retained the emperor as the highest source of power in the country. 
directly below the emperor were his advisors, who were basically the leaders of the Chozu and Satsuma clan, who had been in charge since 1868. Um, there was a parliament created known as the Diet. The job of the Diet was to make laws and advise the emperor on government policy. Voting rights were expanded. Now, instead of just owning property, um, you could be 25 years old and own a little bit of property. Uh, you were given freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of, from search and seizure, but there were some caveats to that. Basically, if the government thought you were a danger to them, you could still be searched. And Japan really is going to start this idea of expansion and imperialism. And a lot of that has to do with just, it's hard for Japan to provide enough food for its people. By 1890, over 50 million people lived on Japan's four main islands. Now to compare that to the United States, in 1890, there were 63 million people living there. So Japan is about 25 times smaller than the United States and has nearly as many people. So this caused Japan to have to continually import more and more and more and more stuff. Uh, Japan, when we get into the early 1900s, is going to decide to try and take foreign territory to fix its overcrowding problems and try and correct the food that it was missing. And there are really two fours that happen. In 1894, Japan defeats China in a very brief war over the control of Korea. China's army refuses to fight, and China does not owe a, cert a single victory. In the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905, uh, this is right after the, the Russians have completed the Trans-Siberian Railroad. And... Japan was okay with the building of the railroad, and Japan was okay with the establishment of a Russian military base known as Port Arthur. Japan just wanted Russia to respect its decision and stay out of, of Korea. And of course, Russia does not do that, and the war starts. By the time the war is over, Japan has completely destroyed the Russian army. Japan has completely destroyed the Russian navy. And Japan is going to be seen as a true equal to any Western power found in Europe. Now, once again, this is just video lecture one of two for this week, so make sure that you do carve out some time to watch the second video. And if you have any questions on either this video or the next video, please, please, please let me know. Uh, ain't modern Japan, modern China is a subject that I enjoy teaching and I enjoy learning about. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. But until next time, we'll see you later. I hope you enjoy your week, and don't forget to take some time to watch the second video for this week. Have a good day. See ya.